here. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape. Let me introduce my brotherhood of cinema here, the bros of cinema here. Uh, Morgan's not here tonight because of concerning issues in life. Not gonna go on. Mm -hmm. And uh, Devin's not here because work, work schedule. Mm -hmm. But she's only temporary, so yeah. Uh, so first up, we've got. James Sullivan, also known as Jaime, dude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by... In Bilingual Education Now! They, we must only learn one language, and that is English! Stop... Okay. <laughs> oh, go on, go on. <laughs> Stop teaching Spanish in all 50 states! Why End it before it <laughs> leaves California! Like I told you on Twitter, just replace English just replace English what you said with French and replace Spanish with English and you pretty much got life in Quebec. I swear. It's exact we've lived like that for a long time. What you said I mean, is no nothing new to me. I I mean yeah, if you if you move to a if you move to a, a country, you should you should learn the native language. It's only it's only polite, but uh, this is talk. That, that thing was talking about. Okay, we can't learn a secondary language in school. What? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing in Quebec. I kid you not. They, they like the the, the French people are so scared. That one day French will suddenly disappear and everything is gonna be in English. They're that paranoid about it. That, like, like there, there are even some people who are so pro-French they refuse to go into any kind of store that would have like an English name with it. Well, are they, are they anti-English? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, gee, but that's trust not. Me, there are the, trust me, there are some people like. There, there, there's a, like a certain type of people in Quebec that they don't want to like go anywhere else. Like they just want to stay in that province. So it's like Chinatown. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Chinatown pretty much dominated an entire piece of land. Um. Would that make them technically linguists? Kinda. I guess. Uh, and moving on. Cinema Royale, where we keep it classy. Uh, and last but not least, our favorite Canadian, Matt Bernays knows Animat. Oh, wacky Jesus. You can't go and do exercise because when you drink water, you immediately get drunk. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. For those of you who don't get it, just let it simmer. Just think about it. <laughs> because that's wacky easy for you. <laughs> and if you drink enough water, you'll learn a Nintendo Wii and die. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. The next morning, Jesus woke up and said, I was just running and drinking my water. What happened? Who are you? <laughs> Oh, that wacky Jesus. <laughs> Tonight's topic for the 80th episode. Yes, this is the 80th episode, mind you. Tonight's topic is adventure films. Now. Wacky Jesus, why are you here bringing up in the adventure films podcast? Oh, that wacky Jesus. It's not even Christmas yet. <laughs> <laughs> then why is his uh then why is his room so shiny and red? <laughs> Are you calling Mike Wacky Jesus? Well you interrupted and called him Wacky Jesus. <laughs> I didn't call him Wacky Jesus. <laughs> it sounded like it. 
Do you honestly think I legit called Mike Wacky Jesus? I wasn't directing anybody as Wacky Jesus. Only Wacky Jesus is Wacky Jesus. Is Wacky Jesus related to Pillow Christ? <laughs> <laughs> no, Pillow Christ is the sleeping kind. Wacky Jesus is the wacky kind. <laughs> Make sure you... <laughs> oh, it's soon going to be time for Wacky Jesus to get a present for Pillow Christ. <laughs> oh, Wacky Jesus, you can't give a bed to Pillow Christ. <laughs> you can't give a pillow to Pillow Christ. Pillow Christ is a pillow, Wacky Jesus. <laughs> Except if it's a wool pillow. Maybe if it's a pillow stuffed with your hair. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Why would you fill it with your hair? <laughs> but now you're bald. Do you think your hair will grow back? <laughs> I said your hair, Matt. Oh, my hair. <laughs> Am I wacky, Jesus, now? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, um, adventure films. Uh, they often use their action scenes, preferably to display and explore exotic locations in an energetic way. You know, uh, main plot elements include quests for lost continents, a jungle, mountain, island, uh, coast... Uh, urban or, de de or desert settings, characters going on treasure hunts, and her heroic journeys for the unknown. Uh, some adventure films are most likely set in, in a period background may include adapted from stories, historical fiction. Some might be in space. You know, some are some adventures are in space for crying out loud. Uh, maybe some fantasy. Mostly adventure films are fantasy related. Sometimes horror. Even war films, you know, can have an adventure to it. Um, uh, the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah, that sort of thing. You know, popular, you know, uh, concepts of adventure films include a outlaw fighting for justice or battling a tyrant, uh, a la Robin Hood, Zorro, or Star Wars. Uh, suspense or dangerous situations that characters must escape from. Uh, pirates, swashbuckling is actually a type of venture film. Uh, so we could have chose any kind of pirate film, but maybe that's a, actually a topic of its own for a future episode. Um, a journey or quest of some kind of, uh, of some kind, searching for a lost city or a hidden treasure, a la King Solomon Mines, Indiana Jones. I did talk about King Solomon Mines on the Canon Films episode, so if you want to check that out, go watch the Canon Films episode. That's actually a riot. I'll, I'll talk about the sequel soon here. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's just basically, you know, a type of genre that not a lot of, Hollywood's been turning out some adventure films here and there, some space ones, some relating to, like, Indiana Jones is a great example of that, and there's a bunch more, but, <sighs> there's so many to go through, but we only have three, we only have three, um, Three, this is just a small sample of what adventure films we might do a part two in the future, so take it easy, people. Uh, who would like to start first? Hmm. Oh, so this is sort of a crapshoot. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, I don't know. Roll a dice. Hmm. Um, flip the coin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, since you... Uh, since you... Uh, Mentioned, yeah, that yes, yeah, some of them are in space. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'll start with me. All right. Well, that's all the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, my film is a space adventure. Now, I'd actually thought of a few different possibilities... Um, I, uh, one of, one of which, uh, I considered last week, I was, uh, I was going to watch the, uh, Star Trek, the motion picture, 
which is the only Star Trek that I have not seen all the way through. Um, actually, I lied. Uh, I've barely seen any of Star Trek Nemesis. Uh, but you you know what I mean with the original yep. crew yep. and everything. And then I fell asleep because it's that my my goodness, everything uh it it's not a bad movie, but it's boy, is it tedious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean it's very be- it's very pretty and whatnot and very very musical, but my my goodness, it's like Okay, spaceships, cool. What else? Exactly. You're not 2001. No, they're trying to be. They're trying to be 2001. And um, so that it it looked impressive. Maybe I'll finish it at some point. No, the movie that I that I decided to go with is based off a video game series that uh, my sister's company had a rap party for. Because she works at Sony. Really? Yes. My uh, sister the works at S- or? Sony PlayStation. Ah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, what is she? A designer? Or a programmer? Or? I I I shouldn't really talk the uh, specifics of her of okay, her uh, position here. I will say this. The. This movie I'm talking about is Ratchet and Clank, which I sat back and and watched, and uh, I thought it I thought it was cute, but I I I've never played the games. I'm I'm not, I'm not a PlayStation right. person. Right. Um. So. I'm I'm guess I'm waiting for them to uh, to port it to PC at some point. Come hell or nah. high water. <laughs> it's made it's made for the PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 I could get it anywhere else. <clears throat> I, yeah, so my luck is my luck is out there. I'll just have to settle for the movie. Yeah. Um and what is it about exactly? Well, it's a story, it's a space adventure. That uh, that tells a story of a young guy who works at an outpost, uh, working on mechanics, dreams of something bigger. Then an adventurer at la- lands in his lap where he has to go out and defeat an evil empire that's created that's created a weapon that's got the capacity to destroy a planet. Oh no, wait! I'm talking about Star Wars. No, Ratchet and Clank oh, is yeah. the movie about a young guy who works uh, uh, who works to add a me- as a mechanic at, at a place, uh, wishes for something more, then uh, uh, adventure lands in his in his forte, and he has to go on and take on an empire with a weapon that destroys entire planets and then reassembles them. That's different, right? <laughs> oh, oh boy. Gross. So, yeah, basically not only vi- yeah, not only visually does it try so hard to be Star Wars, but even in the story it's like it really wants to be Star Wars, period. Yeah. It's I mean, I I I, 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 mind you, I sat through this this movie a, a number of times, and it's um, just to just to stay awake for this. Uh, there was, um, and Matt's the only one here who's also seen it. So it's true. Uh, so he so he can testify. He did a whole review on it. What we have here is a case of. Uh, uh, a, a case of a movie that tries to tell an origin story, and it um, it it pretty much uh, it pretty much plays out all the points. I feel like with all the with all the talent that they got for this, uh, Paul Giamatti, John Goodman, Rosario Dawson, Sylvester Stallone was even a part, and I didn't even I didn't even recognize him. Oh boy. 
That's pretty bad. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that under underused. Uh, you got celebrity voice talent, and it's completely it's completely underused. But um, at least John Goodman was recognizable. Yeah. And that's the only one that I was like, okay, that's Sully right there. Um, everybody else, um, it, it could have been their their voices are not distinctive enough. But um, yeah, we have uh, in in this film, Ratchet is a character who's a lombax, this cat-like alien creature. Mm-hmm. Uh, who who wants to join? Who wants to join uh, a team of heroic douchebags? Yeah, I'm just I'm just gonna put it like that because it's like it's it's like what if Buzz Lightyear had a complete ego and only cared about Pretty himself. Much. It, Captain Quark. That's what it is. It, it, the best way the best way to put it is that it's the mo- it's like the most unlikable team of Star Command. <laughs> it's a uh, he's a combination. Uh, Captain Quark is is a combination of Buzz Lightyear and uh, Zap Brannigan. Yeah, actually, the the best way like this is a bit of a more obscure comparison, but. Uh, Captain Quark is, yeah, he's like part Buzz Lightyear, but the better comparison would be with, um, oh, who was it? It was, oh, I forgot his name, but it, it was that guy from Escape from Planet Earth, the one that, uh, Brendan Fraser would play. It's almost the exact same type of character. Yeah, it's like, uh, st- oh, that, sport, sport oh. Supernova. there we go, that dumbass. Oh right, I I only saw your review of that. Um, we were trying to forget that movie. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, it's comparable. <laughs> yeah, let's let's keep reusing these annoying characters and yeah. and see where we can find it. Uh, Clank is a robot um, created by the evil empire. Um. Uh, whose names I I can't even remember because we'll we'll just call it Evil Empire. Mm-hmm. And that's all that's all it really is. Um, who has a defect? He's good. That's a defect here. Yeah, really. It's a it's a yes. All of all of our robots have to be evil, but uh, this one has a glitch in the programming. He turned out to be a good guy. And, uh, it's uh, and it, his design is kind of like, it it's like uh, he's like C three PO with uh, mesh with Stitch, I'd say. Uh, in term in terms of the personality, he's three PO. In terms of Stitch, he's got the build. Yeah, and especially it, if you, I just want to add also, like, isn't it kind of weird or like? It doesn't how somehow it doesn't make sense where like the good bot somehow like like they craft them to be the exact same thing but with the little clank they they just made this small little thing that came that just popped out and like somehow he's good. Mhm. Like how did you go from the menacing design to the little thingy seriously? Mm, yes. So um as as far as Star Wars comparisons, I can't really I can't really think of much more except for the fact that uh, one of the first scene, scenes that Ratchet is in, uh, we have a uh, we ha- we have uh, the obligatory spaceship going uh, zipping through the canyons scene, which never which never ceases to remind me of pod racing, but. Um, yeah, he he tries out for uh, for Captain Quark's crew of uh, of good guys. He doesn't he doesn't have the heart for it. But then he becomes okay. This is where things differentiate. He he buddies up with Clank. Um, he 
they try to go to the they try to go to the city to warn of an imperial attack, and they they rather goof their way into 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 fighting off the attack, but in the in in the process become heroes. And now Captain Quark has to take them on. Okay, so that's kind of that's kind of a nice variation. Instantly, instantly the fame goes to Ratchet's head. Mm-hmm. It starts going. And instantly again, Captain Quark is jealous, decides to become a turncoat, which we both know. Which we which we both know uh, he he's gonna he gets uh, he gets tricked into working with the Empire because of some deal. Uh, we both know he's gonna have a turnaround at some point because because uh, script said so. Um, Ratchet and Clank, uh, uh, what they 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 come apart at at one point and come back together. Even. So there, there are so many, there's so many points where it's just, it's just hitting the story notes. But um, as in, as impressive, as impressive and well animated as it looks, um, I, I'd have to say, I, I kept this one for a rental as a reason, and um, that, that's all I can really say is it's, it's a rental. I mean, maybe you're. Maybe uh, the kids will enjoy it, but I find it. This is the sort of thing that I'm already starting. For, I'm already starting to forget. I can't. I can't. I can't rightly remember um, exactly how everything climaxes. And I watched it so many times. I just wanted to stay awake. But no, I'm looking at the. Uh, uh, I'm looking at the um, I'm looking at the Wikipedia article here just to remind myself of what exactly happened in the plot. Mm-hmm. And there's the phone. That's a business line. I need to go shove it in the in a closet somewhere. Yeah. Ah, you mind, so. You mind, if I, you mind if I take this one? Hmm. What? <laughs> yes. Pass the ball. All right. Here we go. Now the thing is, yes, I have. I'm one of the other ones that has actually seen Ratchet and Clank. And by the way, I just want to start off by saying uh, an interesting factoid regarding Ratchet and Clank. Um, I don't know if you guys may know, but Ratchet and Clank was actually a massive box office flop. So much so that the company who made it, Rainmaker, ended up losing about ten million dollars. And what's actually really interesting was that one of the writers of, um, yeah, one of the writers of the Ratchet and Clank movie, T.J. Miller, whose credits previously was uh, many of the uh, other Ratchet and Clank games, he would actually go and pass the blame on the other people, like the other writer and the director, to how the movie actually ended up. It's like, oh, most of... Oh uh, well, most of the most of the things that you see in there is actually because of the other writers and that guy. Uh, some of my jokes are in there, but it's mostly them why it ended up as it is. And like he's mostly doing it to cover his own butt because he's currently working for other studios to write movies. The dude is a freaking coward to admit that he made a piece of crap. T.J. Fixman. T.J. Or... Miller, no, not T.J. Miller. Yeah, T.J. Fixman. There yeah, it's, it's it's here on the on the article. I'm and just looking at it. And funny enough, he's supposed to be the guy to replace Gendy Tartakovsky on Sony Pictures Animation's Popeye. Oh boy! <laughs> what a mistake and a half that is. <laughs> no, but going back into oh, um... I see the other I see the other writer is Canadian. Okay. Well, it, it, it was made in Vancouver, so, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyways, um, going into the movie itself, yeah. Um, the one thing, James, uh, there are actually a lot more comparisons to Star Wars than you than you can actually imagine. Uh, most namely, uh, for me, it was absolutely visually. Because you could tell in terms of the settings with the desert and the large city, like, the, the large cities 
and how some of the elements try to replicate the Death Star and Cloud City. That and also the tra have you ever noticed the transitions? They are very Star Wars like. Oh, the yeah. the linear dissolve. Yeah, pretty much. Right. Yeah, stuff like that. So I, you could I hadn't thought of that actually, but yeah. go on. Yeah. So in terms of the visual aspect, you can definitely tell how there are many components that really do try to be Star Wars. But for me, one of, my, one of the biggest issues is that the writing is dreadful. It reminds me a lot of Planes, in a way, because the, the structure of it is really messed up, where um, the first half of the movie is the entire setup that Ratchet really wants to be a galactic warrior. And then the rest of the film is just, he, okay, he is, and now he's going on to this mission. And speaking of Ratchet, like... You know, in the first half, like, he has that old trope of, oh, I want to be this big galactic warrior. And then when he becomes one, all types of personality, anything that would make him a character is just stripped away, and he becomes this completely bland hero. So much so that all of the cre that a good chunk of the film then suddenly becomes the Captain Quark. He is so jealous of Ratchet to the point that he suddenly becomes the star of the movie, where we have to see his stupid shenanigans going around of him being a complete egotistical idiot. And uh, it's just, un and honestly, in that retrospective, it was just unbearable. Like, the only character that I can think of that is actually tolerable is, uh, who, who's the purple girl? Like do you, do you like there were two there were two girls in the Galactic Rangers. One was like the fight the fighting type girl, and the other was the nerdy chick uh, that was mostly helping out Clank. Let's see, uh, I'm I'm looking through the cast again. We have Drag, uh, Ratchet's mentor, uh, Bell Bella Thorne as Cora Verilux. Probably uh, either way, like. That girl, and keep in mind, that girl was tolerable. She is not like an idiot. Like, the reason why she's tolerable is because she was surrounded by a bunch of freaking idiots. And even at that, she barely has a personality in herself. For me, I consider her Rule 34 bait. Because they designed her with such like an attractive hot body that she was mostly made to be like this, um, like she was mostly made so that uh, the gamers watching her find her hot, and eventually you go to rule34.com and you'll be like, yeah, you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, specific type of imagery with her. So yeah, not, like she's mostly just rule 34 bait. I'm, I will give the movie this, that the people of Rainmaker actually did a pretty good job in terms of the visuals. Like, it's not 100% mm -hmm. like feature film quality, but it actually does look pretty good. But other than that, it's just the biggest issue with the movie is the it's just the writing itself. And funny enough, from what I can, yeah, not whole home. It was it was garbage. Uh, but the thing is, is that um, what's actually very interesting is that even the fans are actually completely split. From what I've seen, uh, there was either one side of the fan base that absolutely enjoyed it because hey it's ratchet and clank it's a movie so they'll like it that or i've seen a lot of people actually saying that it's a complete misrepresentation of the film and it's better off to just play the games oh the complete misrepresentation of the franchise you mean yeah pretty much and even like for me like same same thing with me i have never seen i've never played a ratchet and clank game but after after play, like after seeing that film it honestly really turned me off from like honestly playing it it's just like if this is what i'm going if this is what i would be delivered in game form i'm sorry it's a major pass for me even though like nowadays it has been months since i've actually seen it and like I would probably be fine if I would actually pick up a Ratchet and Clank game, but yeah, if like looking back at it, it was a massive turnoff for the franchise for me. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak again from someone who's uh, who's not really familiar with the uh, uh, the franchise. Um, I'd like to, if I may, do a screen share here uh, to just. So 
uh, to just sort of uh, uh, bring up a few things. Uh, if you may, yes, do show. Share screens. Okay, yes, I would like to share this screen because it's the only screen I'm on on my laptop. Okay, so here's here's some official imagery from the film, and what what we're getting here is it. Let's let's forget everything back here exists all right. because because it's all forgettable anyway okay well uh, that's interesting just, that i don't see anything yet can you be patient okay please? just focus on ratchet and clank uh in the foreground here what 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 do we have here we've got oh, there we um go. there we go mm -hmm. okay yeah ignore these guys these guys these guys just this guy and this guy. Okay. Yeah, so um, take into account the designs. They're very much from the, from the games uh, overall, I'd say. Except you look at um, it, you look at um, uh, Ratchet's, Ratchet's expression here as a uh, as a as a heroic character. Uh, his fur is very um, lightly rendered uh, his expression uh, he's got sort of a, a a very slightly tough smile on here and then you look over at over at clank and he's he's just got sort of this this uh almost almost uh, a generic expression combined with combined with a smile it's just like oh i'm kind of curious over here this is this is representing our. This is what's representing our characters, and now I'm going to compare it to a game cover. <laughs> oh, that is. This scary. is what you get in the game. Uh, we what we have here is he's packing. Let's take that into account. Mm -hmm. um, although he does use guns in the film, but. He's got he's got something here. I can't quite place it, but he looks he looks slightly older and a little bit more, um, shall we say, uh, experienced in in the ways of his world. The expression really says tough guy. Nothing is really nothing is really soft about this character, even though even though he's furry. And Clank over here. He's just had a really bad day, so this whole this whole thing is uh, is is uh, is just saying let's let's have a badass game here, regardless. Mm. You look at the film; it's softened up. By the way, I just want to mention as well. What's actually interesting is actually in the background. If you go back into the game, um, like in the game cover. You'll notice that in the background, it is nothing but all the different types of weaponry, mm -hmm. which is actually quite interesting because, like, you get a blueprint of what kind of weapons that you can use. So mm -hmm. it tells you that this is the kind of game that, like, you'll switch up the different types of weapons. So, like, yes. yeah, over here. Yep. Like, it's mm -hmm. the blueprints of all the different weapons. Mm -hmm. So, like, it does give you promise of, like, that, that kind of variety and, um, the, like, the different kind of uh, weapons that you can go and use. Like, it looks fun. Like, it does have a lot of promise. But then going back into the movie, um, like, where are see... half of these weapons in the movie anyway? <laughs> Not even. Oh, there, I remember there was even one scene they try to advertise that crap. Like, most of what you see here, it's rather generic, honestly, and pretty much unfinished. Because, on one hand, like, you got some of the more main characters. Like, you got the giant face of the Paul Giamatti on the side, and then right beside um, right, right beside uh, Ratchet, you got Captain Quark, who's somehow oh. smiling, and is like, he looks cool, he's like, yeah. And, um, like, for some He looks like the tick in this picture, doesn't he? Yeah, a little bit, actually. <laughs> it's either the, either, um, e either uh, the tick, or, or who, who was the cap, who was the character, like, 
Captain Chin or something from, or Chin Man from Fairly Odd Parents. And then, like, then you also got the robot who was barely in the movie, by the way, the uh, the Sylvester Stallone robot. And interestingly enough, like, on the corner right there, on top of the robots chasing them, you got two, you got the two uh, members of the um, yeah the Galactic. two. Yeah, two, two like members the of the Galactic uh, Warriors. Mm-hmm. And, like, they, they actually forgot the purple chick, funny enough. So, like, they don't yeah. even list off all the characters. So, yeah, this... This, is, this is just a kind of lazy attempt of an advertising bit. Yeah. It's... Yeah, that's that's all I really got. I, I did have, um... Oops. I opened up two instances of Skype all by accident. Um, I, I, I will give the, the film this much. There was one, there was one joke in there that kind of made me laugh, but only because, only because it was self-aware. One moment. Uh, during the attack on the city, uh, there is, there's one, uh, there's one city guard that gets knocked off of a, off of a, a high place, oh, and as he's I going down, yeah, I know he mean. does the Wilhelm scream that you hear in, hear in every movie, and the other guard reaches over and says, Wilhelm! I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, I can, I can kind of dig that. I can kind of dig that. But that, if that's the only thing that I'm going to be remembering from this movie, I don't know. Just because of the Wilhelm scream? Yeah. Yeah, honestly, it's not worth remembering, and I'm just going to take advice on uh, the on what most of the ga- most of the wiser gamers are saying. Just play the games. That's it. Yeah. Uh. Uh, it's, it's, it's ho-hum in my opinion, but that's all. I got nothing else. I've been patiently waiting till you guys were finished. Because mm-hmm. I've played the first three games in the franchise. I played Ratchet, oh. I played Ratchet and Clank. I played Ratchet and Clank going Commando. And I played Ratchet and Clank up your arsenal. I've been comparing plots of the movie and the game. I've not seen it, the movie yet, but I've played the first game. That's initially what the movie's based off of. And I'm comparing plots, and it's not even close to the original game. It's like it has some elements, some elements of the game when it comes to plot points. But they seem to change everything about it. Like... I can understand what the actually the actual writer of the games was talking about actually, because I think it's like oh the director near the race fucked it up. It's like I, I got it kind of you know it's like oh it's all my fault, but you know I can sort of see that because it it was baby and maybe they looked at the script it's like oh I'm gonna change this rewrite that you know that could have happened. Uh, the thing is that he could legitimately be telling the truth, you know he could. Yeah, uh, he could. Uh, he could have written an excellent script, and we wouldn't know that. Exactly, but mm-hmm. but um, the Captain Quark thing, just that the whole Rangers thing, and that's that wasn't even a whole plot point in the game. That was just like a side note thing, where uh, Ratchet was an admirer of Captain Quark. He was like a TV. It was like a TV series, like TV show icon character he's like i admire this guy he's pretty cool he never wanted to join anything like that he just wanted to have some adventure i think because he was a mechanic in the game but clank comes out of nowhere and then he knows that drex uh, chairman drex is gonna uh destroy planets and blah 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 blah, and it goes into that whole adventure thing um clank if you're curious of why he's so small and he's good, it's because it was a glitch or a misprogram when they were computing out robots. So he was one of that one little percent that just like, boop, oh, that's a mistake, oh, and he just goes off. 
I know it's very stupid, but it was, that was in the game at least. They explained that. Um, it was weird because I was looking at the characters and Drex, voiced by Paul Giamatti in the movie, but he was voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson in the game. They needed celebrity voice talent. Yeah, they just need. Yeah, that, that's the whole reason. Like to bring in Paul Giamatti, John Goodman, and Sylvester Stallone. It was just for celebrity endorsement. Yeah. Uh, don't forget John Goodman. I said John Goodman. Oh, you did? Oh. Yeah. What's Rosario Dawson. One? Rosario Dawson, then. <laughs> it's, um... I guess. <laughs> but see, the, what the game works with is, like, like Matt said, in the background of the video game cover, you see all these gadgets and guns. And you use them throughout the whole movie. It's like a puzzle game, more or less. You have to figure out what weapon to use for each situation. There would be like a grappling hook. You have to grapple, you know, from place to place. Like Spider-Man, you go cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. You know, you use guns. You shoot, you know, aliens down. ba 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 ben You know, and you change it up. You know, every once in a while, you get a new gun, get a new gun. It's all about the arsenal. It's really cool. You know, there's some crazy stuff, too. Like, I've seen the sheep one in the movie, and I'm thinking... Was that in the game? Like, there, there. I think it was actually. It was in the game too. But there was sheep a... thing. Yeah, it, it must be. Like, it must like I was... somewhere in not in the game itself, but somewhere in the franchise. I think so because I guess because there's why other else games. Would they bring up that thing? I was there's other games I haven't played, and they must have added new stuff. So I was like thinking because there's a bunch of them. Like there's there's a there's a suck canning where you can suck up aliens and shoot them out at each other. You know, and there's a. Oh, there's so many lists. It's, like, really cool just to have all these guns and just do it, but it's... But they go to planet the planets, you know, just to, you know, get this, get that, get what they need, hop into their spaceship, fly off again. You know, you go to planet the planet, you know, getting these things in order to uh, defeat the umpire and Drex in general. And then there was the twist where Quark was working for Drex in the game. It was like, wow, that's... Big yeah, they, took, they took a while to discuss about it. And the way that they did it in... Um, the way that they did it in the movie, it was absolutely dumb. But the weirdest thing is that I actually accept it because I accept that Quark is an absolute freaking idiot and only he would be stupid enough to accept it. See, yeah, they don't play up Captain Quark or the other rangers in the first game that often. They, I think... What was it? Which one was it? Was it... Fucking James. Um, sorry. I think it's in the second or third game they use Quark in the rangers a little bit more, but it's like a side thing, not too much focus. So they just really muddled with Quark and everybody else a little too much. I just... It was just like, you just play the games for the experience. It's like, it's a really good, you know, way to get your aggression out, especially with all the guns you get through and all the... It's a puzzle game, too. It's, like, interesting how you have to use whatever... Because there's... I remember playing the game, and there's, like, a part when you, you use a gun. Like, it's a, it's a little key gun where you put the key in, and you have to go use the puzzle to try to figure out how to unlock the door, you know, kind of like a little maze door. And it's like, it was innovative at the time. That was 15 years ago for crying out loud. Now we got this new movie that just doesn't fully represent the game that well. It just doesn't show the mechanics. Like I've seen previews for it, and I was just like, "There was a game that." Yeah, they also oh. there was a game that was released at the same time and it said that it was much better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, well don't, that's well, no. just celebrating at a company. Exactly, it uh, is. From what I'm hearing, yeah, that's probably the what they're celebrating. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you put that in the game form, that would have been better. Like I was, I was watching game I footage of that. Really yeah, yeah. I think, mm-hmm. I think it was good to, to reboot it. Like I think it's good to have that launch title, but the movie just attached to it just didn't, uh, just didn't seem to work well. Like, so, I mean, I can understand the fans. I've I played the game, so I, I have, I don't know. I guess I, I'll watch it eventually, just for shits and giggles, but. Otherwise, I'll just stick to my games. Good plan. Um, yeah, from what you were describing there, I can understand why some of the game mechanics might have been discarded, like a, a gun that shoots a key. But I would 
for a lot of what that could have gone into the film, it would have been interesting to see a first timer hero, you know, just sort of be loaded up with all this arsenal and just be like, what, which one do I have to use here? You know, just sort of go, go through it. It might, it might have actually been a funny moment. In, exactly. In movie, but... Exactly. Because Ratchet is not like this hero, you know, he's a mechanic that works on his spaceship in the beginning of the game, and he's just, it's like, ah, I wish for adventure, and just, like, doesn't know anything. Like, he's seen Captain Quark on TV, so he knows what it, some kind of adventure is, but he's such a newcomer. Like, they would have played up the newcomer thing, we, you know, they, they get, he gets, he finds these weapons or gadgets along the way, and it's like, who, what does this do? And it, there might be some hilarious stuff, you know. I would have loved to see, like, he, he gets a suck cannon, you know? He just starts using it, like, <laughs> oh, oh! <laughs> It'd be like a funny bit where you just look at it right now, like, boom! <laughs> ah! So it would have been... It they just... might have done that, because there is one scene where they just display the weapons. Like, all they do is display the weapons as if it was a commercial for the DLC. Oh, yeah. 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 At one point, it even... At one point, it even... Uh, they they have they have a gun that squirts stuff out and they they do the they do you the service of squirting that at the camera, uh, so you know it's a 3D movie. Uh, okay, but yeah, like like there there's just tons of gadgets, tons of guns to go through in the games and just just a massive list. Like they just don't even scratch the surface in the freaking movie. Like that's that's the whole point of the game. It's like you see the arsenal of what they have to use and you get to see these creative, like, uh, battles between aliens and villains, and Dr. Dr. Nefarious, the robot, the, um, because I was reading about the movie, and, like, they feature him a little bit as an organic being, and then all of a sudden you can turn into a robot later. He's not a main feature, but he ends up in the second or third game, which is, I think Dr. Nefarious was uh, Captain Quark's, like, main baddie in, like, the TV show in the game, and, like, that's kind of the lore of it at all. Um, the game mechanics were pretty cool, so, I don't know, I liked it for what it was. The games, well, we got a testimony there. The games are better. So many to, so many to choose from, it's a massive just franchise. Take, just take that game and put that entire thing in the pile of, like, crappy game, movies based on games. Yeah, that's what the trope is, the crappy video game movies. Uh, we're going to have another one, another one uh, this fall, Assassin's Creed, but I haven't played Assassin's Creed. And that's labeled as an Avenger film, too. Mm. But yeah, yeah. Whew. Ratchet and Clank, Move. moving on. Moving on, we have what? What would you like to hear more about? Would you like to hear about Rescue Dead Under or Alan Corden Main and Lost City of Gold? I might as well go at it. All right, so funny enough, originally my uh, my story, my movie, I pick up the phone. <laughs> oh no, James, that's you. Anyways, um, my, uh, originally I was supposed to talk about the wildlife since it was recently released, but unfortunately mm. since Devin didn't came in, she was supposed to talk about rescuers, but decided to go and pass the baton. So I've already said my fill on my review about it, and it will be discussed in the upcoming animation podcast since it is the, it, it had the worst opening for an animated feature of the decade. So Thank anyway, you, Devin. Move on. <laughs> so anyways, going into The Rescuers Down Under, I have stated this several times, that it is the most underrated Disney film there is. And my god, it is so fascinating. Like, let me just start off with probably the best scene in the movie, the opening. The way that it just introduces, like, the way that it is introduced is that uh, the kid, Cody just helps out a giant eagle named Maruhute, uh, because it was in a trap, and decides to let it go. How is he rewarded? By flying into the air 
with the eagle and you get some amazing shots. Apparently I heard that uh, these scene, that many of these scenes were actually inspired by some of the Studio Ghibli films at the time. So uh, since it is early, I'm guessing movies like Nausicaa, Castle in the Sky, and Kiki's Delivery Service, and probably Totoro as well. But it is absolutely gorgeous, beautifully animated. You see the characters just soaring through the sky. A phenomenal score that really enhances the mood. Just absolutely beautiful. And then you get to the actual film itself, where you actually see the Rescue Aid Society, and the whole mission is to go save Cody because he was captured by Percival C. McLeach, the villain of the film, who is pretty much a poacher. And quite a threatening poacher, especially with a wonderful performance by George C. Scott. Um, so with that said, Rescue uh, Aid Society. With the Rescue Aid Society, they actually <laughs> did make uh, Bernard and Bianca a lot more interesting. Where Bernard, he's in the middle of a date with Bianca, and he's ready to go and pop the question. So most of his, uh, most of the character about him, is that he needs to try to build himself a lot more confidence, while simultaneously trying to ask Bianca for uh, her hand in marriage. While at the same time, you also got Bianca, a dar like a darling character, always ready to go for the adventure. And um, along the way, they are introduced with a new character named Jake, who is pretty much uh, the Australian representative of the Rescue Aid Society. And along the way, like he, like Jake seems to be the cool guy, but he's not Mr. Steal Your Girl in a sense. Like that's how. Um, that's how Bernard kind of perceives him, but, uh, like, he's just being the cool guy just to help things out. And, like, you know... He's the dumpy of the group. Yeah, like, he has, like, he is the, like, the cool guy that knows his way around Australia. But, you know, like, he is definitely likable. But, out of all the Disney films, I must say, like, probably even more than, like, some of the recent stuff, like, uh, Zootopia and Big Hero 6, this is the most... Hence, Disney film you can ever find. Uh, like the action scenes that you go through, like it really does capture the scale, especially when, um, like, when Bianca and Bernard have to go into such heavy machinery. It is just purely crazy. Oh, that that scene where they're. Oh yeah, like when they're when they're driving through like I think the tank or like the big. Um, crane or something like that but either they're, way they're running on the treads trying oh, yeah, to get out of it yeah definitely a lot of fun yeah and uh, another another thing that i would like to add is actually uh the comic relief which in, unfortunately um the original voice actor of orville i believe in the what was it orville or wilbur in the first movie i'm looking it up right now it's orville yeah orville yeah voice actor unfortunately he passed away so they replaced him with john candy for his brother wilbur and um the right brothers great, yeah the a great con and he definitely was a great comic relief especially like when he lands onto australia like he would get he would get like hospitalized because he ended up like crashing himself and uh like what, what follows afterwards like it gives you a good sense of comedy in a way you also get uh, a few comedic bits from the other, from a few other characters as well. Like there is a new batch of like uh, captured animals from Percival C. McLeach, and you know there there is a bit of a charm. I will admit, like I, I wouldn't blame anyone if they say that the lizard is a little bit annoying, but you know the the, the characters are still charming regardless. But overall, uh, Rescuers Down Under, highly entertaining, really crazy. Uh, like well well animated well written a fantastic sequel like this definitely tr this is one of the rare sequels that absolutely triumphs the original and overall um definitely like honestly i'd be crazy enough to say that rescuers down under is as good as the other movies that was released around the time as good as movies like the little mermaid beauty and the beast aladdin and the lion king Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing I want to discuss, what would be an interesting question, is that nowadays, 
what do we actually consider Rescuers Down Under underrated? Because nowadays, there, we're starting to see a trend. We're seeing a lot more movies that they used to be box office swaps. Nobody really talks about them. And then they would climb up the ranks from being underrated to a classical gem. Um, great examples of this include The Iron Giant, which uh, now is considered one of the greatest animated films of all time, and recently they just came out with the signature edition on Blu-ray. And at the same time, there's also The Secret of Nim, which nowadays that movie is regarded as one of Don Blue's greatest works, and with good reason as well. Uh, so I'm just wondering, I'm actually seeing a lot more of a presence with the Rescue Rich Down Under. Like, whenever Disney would do a thing, like when they would talk about Disney animation, they would often bring up the Rescue Rich Down Under as one of the examples. So would you guys say that nowadays, uh, is the Rescue Rich Down Under still uh, an underrated film where it doesn't get a lot of attention? Or would you consider it, like... Uh, like nowadays, a Disney hit that they are that 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 movie in particular is getting as much treatment as the other Disney classics. Hmm. And it's still not getting as much treatment. I mean, they don't have a they don't have a Diamond Edition Blu-ray or anything. So technically, they well they didn't get a Diamond Edition Blu-ray, but technically, uh, there is this. They released it simultaneously where you got the regular Rescuers for the 35th anniversary, and they also released Rescuers Down Under. Oh, yeah, but, uh, a two-disc edition. Yeah, pretty much a big mm -hmm. one, too. It's kind so, of like the same with what they did with Fantasia and Fantasia 2000. Yeah, they, they shipped them on onto the same uh, collection together. It sounds like they just sort of say, hey, it, it's, it's not so special. I mean... I mean, I, I know you love uh, Mask of the Phantasm, mm -hmm. but that's only been released on DVD with uh, with Sub Zero, I think. Or has it I been? Um, it on... has... Hold on, uh, let me get this. Yeah, it's actually released on its own. Oh, okay. the, it's not easy to find, I must say. Like, I, I remember I was in Florida when I got this, and it was probably like four bucks. So, or no, I think this was one of the more expensive. Like, this was like eight bucks, but still. Like this was this was a lucky find for me. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, point point being, if you if you have it released on on Blu-ray as as only a two disc, but it's not it's not on its own. I don't think they're. I don't think that sounds like they're giving it um, uh, as as much push as the other stuff. You don't see advertisements on the, the Disney YouTube channel saying, uh, buy now Diamond Edition or, or what have no, you. No, the Diamond Edition, I mean, they're they're saving that for their like massively big classics. I mean, you could argue with that with many of the other films because Disney has done that with a lot of them. They did it with uh, many of the... Uh, what was it? Yeah, they did that with a lot of the... What, what am I about to say? Like, with a lot of the direct-to-video sequels, you know, they did it with Pocahontas, they did it with Mulan. Uh, like I stated before, they did it with Fantasia and Fantasia 2000. Uh, what else? They did it with Emperor's in Groove. They did it with Lilo and Stitch, and that is a major hit movie. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an exception with what you're uh, saying. Even... Um, uh, even uh, a goofy movie is sort of climbed up higher a little bit in the in the consciousness ranks, I think. But when you say Rescuer is down under, um, at, yeah, I'd have to say uh, when when comparing it with its original film, I, I actually saw down on, down under first, and. I don't really think that the the original Rescuers is is a is a bad movie per se. Uh, I will say, um, I will say if you watch that one though after this one, it's kind of it, it feels kind of like you downgraded a little bit. Yeah, no, no, no. I never said that uh, mm -hmm. Rescuers was a bad movie. It's just. No. It's you know it, it, you know honestly the best way to put it is that it, that movie 
is also an adventure movie, but it doesn't have any of the peril. There is no sense of danger whatsoever. Well, uh, it's all there's there's technically there is peril in the film, but it's all it's all played up as very as very comical and very whimsical. So, uh, yeah, with Down Under, you you see a kid get knocked off of a the top of a of a freaking cliff. I mean, I, I remember watching that as a kid, just like, whoa, I, this guy's this this kid is having a bad day. <laughs> but then he gets caught and everything's all right. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it it really took. You know, from uh, from the uh, the get go, that it's it's taking chances. Um, it's pushing the action and the uh, the overall sense of things to the limit. Uh, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston worked on worked on uh, the original. And they consider that to be their best picture without Walt Disney, which I, 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 um, I, I guess, I guess if you, if you have to, if you have to draw a comparison, maybe they, uh, the, maybe the, the company shot up in the, in the 20 year gap between, between the two films. In terms of so many different uh, mm. techniques and oh yeah, well the thing is is that with the statement that they made with um, that oh the rescuers was the best movie they made without Walt Disney like you got to keep in mind about something there really isn't a lot of films that they made without Walt I mean after like technically after the Jungle Book. There are very few films that the Nine Old Men actually worked on. There was The Aristocats, then afterwards it's Robin Hood, and then The Rescuers, and then there was The Fox and the Hound, and that's it. You, there, there are like four options. And and The Fox and the Hound is is probably the most memorable of the group. Technically, or actually, you know, come to think of it, not four, three and a half. Because they only were because they only worked on it when uh, Todd and Copper were kids. When they became adults, that's when the entire animation was given to the to the new kids. Hmm. Okay. I say still counts. But either way, Mike, you're you're quiet in the corner like usual. Uh, I was just actually looking out to see. If Matt's question of whether it's underrated or not is legible, I typed in uh, Lando Under underrated, and people are saying Lando Under is underrated. Like, people are just, like posting, like, this movie's very underrated. Okay, so it's still underrated. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen well, it. That's good to know. It's still underrated. <laughs> we can X that uh, argument. <laughs> There's, there's the internet a, says so. We're there's, good. There's a couple of lists. <laughs> I was just looking at the top. Tw- I was just looking at the top twenty list. Uh, I was looking at of the most underrated Disney anime films, and it was number thirteen on the list. So. Thirteen, really? Yeah. Um, actually, I was look at Huffington Post did a a top ten list of the most underrated Disney movies. Yeah, I was going to see where the uh, Are the rest live-action films, or are there any other animated ones? Uh, let me look at the top ten here. This is both live-action and animated, so let's see here. Da, 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 da. Nope, number five on the list. Uh, let's see what it says here. Among members of my family, the rescue down under is regarded as a classic, mostly because of the villain as pet Joanna. Joanna is definitely... One of the top five funniest animal sidekicks of all time. Percival McCoy. Because McCur- of Joanna, really? <laughs> per- Best years down under. It's not because of the <laughs> action, it's because of freaking Joanna. And, and Percival McLeegic happens to be my favorite Disney villain ever. If you, want to, if you want a movie about adventure with a villain you can laugh at in most every scene, then go pick out Rescuers Down Under. None of my friends ever talk about this movie. Fair quote. 
These are not Joanna's eggs. Um, yeah, that's, okay, that was interesting. I wanted to see what number one was on both lists. Mm-hmm. Because, let's see, top ten. Bugs Life, Into the Woods, Tron Legacy, Saving Mr. Banks, Fantasia 2000. I wouldn't even, I, I don't think I would count Bugs Life as underrated. Disney is giving it good attention. The Rescue is Under, The Princess and the Frog, The Emperor's New Groove, Tangled and Treasure Planet. Oh, okay. I can see Treasure Planet being very underrated. Yeah. Okay. It does have the. Number one is that Treasure Planet. My goodness. Okay, top 20. Let me take the top 20 really quick here. Just want to see number 20. Pocahontas. Number 19. Mulan. Number 18. Home on the Range. <laughs> Home on the range. Number really. number Someone eight. Someone legit put in home on the range. Uh, the three caballeros. Seventeen. Sixteen Fantasia. Fifteen humpback. Humpback. No. No, it's your dog. Fantasia is on the list. You can't put Fantasia. People regard it as one of the greatest animated films there is. Fantasia is not underrated. Did, did, you, see, did you see Disney going around with Sorcerer Mickey? That's where it's from. Disney is well freaking aware of Fantasia. One of the kids in my class I was in today was carrying around the Mickey Sorcerer hat. I swear. 15, Hunchback Notre Dame. 14, Albert and Company. 13, like I said, Rescuers Down Under. Uh, 12, Black Cauldron. 11, The Rescuers. <laughs> 10, Brother Bear. <laughs> the Bear. Uh, <laughs> because, yeah. of the, because of the Bob and Doug McKenzie mooses. And the fact that I personally, I personally feel like um, uh, Phil Collins' music and Brother Bear was better than Tarzan. <laughs> Nine, the Great Mouse Detective. Eight, Meet the Robinsons. Number seven, Tarzan. Number six, Robin Meet Hood. Robinsons. Number five, Hercules. Number four, The Brave Little Toaster. Uh, number three, Peter Pan. Number two, Treasure Planet. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Peter Pan. <laughs> Peter Pan underrated? <laughs> what? By whose standards? <laughs> Peter Pan underrated. Number one, Atlantis, what? the Lost what? Empire. <laughs> what? Number one, Number one what? Atlantis. The Lost Empire. So basically, <laughs> the ones that don't get the big... Uh, that, that, that don't get the star treatment like the Diamond Edition or the Platinum Edition or the Signature Edition. Uh, except for a few exceptions like freaking Peter Pan and Fantasia for some reason. Mind you, the top 20 is a blog, so it's a, from a personal person, so this person who's doing this list clearly has no idea what most, most underrated means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Define underrated, please. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's still underrated amongst internet people out there, depending on uh, who you uh, read from. So, I mean, I don't, I don't hear anybody talking about it anytime soon. I mean, I, I know Matt obviously talked about it here, but I just outside of the podcast, I never heard anybody talk about the movie in general. Like, I think I remember watching it a long time ago when I was a kid. Like, like I had it. You know, it came out in 1990, it was like a year after I was born, and just, it was one of those classics that, I say, I say classics because it was Disney, anything Disney is a classic in my opinion, mostly anything from Disney. So, I have vague memories of Even the movie. Even the Black Cauldron? Yeah, some people hate it, some people love it, so it depends on who you like. Um, yeah, eh, yeah, but what makes a good adventure movie? That's, a, that's the question I want to dig deep into like what made Rescue Down Under 
an adventure film? What made it a great adventure film? Was the stakes higher than the first film? Was it the setting to Australia making it a great adventure, you know, going through the outback? Was it the obstacles at hand, the action? Like, what what was it that made it so a good adventure to go on? Well, typically, adventure films do engage, do, uh, uh, do uh, have, uh, fall upon, you know, visiting an array of different uh, interesting locations. Whether or not, um, whether or not they're for real on this planet, uh, etc. And I, I think uh, Down Under does uh, does pull that off rather nicely, although I've never been to Australia, so uh, I can't testify. Yeah, yeah. It's um, <laughs> Stick It Out Adventures as goes on somewhat different locations is the... Uh, <sighs> If you've seen the Canon Films episode, I talked about King Solomon Mine, which had Alec Cord in Maine, the, uh, the other Indiana Jones, exploring Africa and all that jazz. And it, it's, it's exciting. It was an interesting movie, to say at least. But I started to watch the sequel for this episode. I was like, kind of curious. Like, I, never, I didn't watch the sequel for the episode, so I was like, okay, I'll watch it for this episode then. Alan Cord in Maine and Lost City of Gold... It was filmed, subscri- uh, filmed like at the same time as King Solomon's Mind, and you could tell that with the second movie they downgraded big time with the effects and kind of how they were filming it. Like I was watching it, and then there's a point like 40 minutes in that they're they're traveling. They're, they're most of the film they're traveling. You see locations all over the place. It's a good they're traveling. They're going down this, like, kind of like this water slide kind of in a cave, like a water lagoon thing, and it was going really fast. But you see the blue screen or green screen, like, they're not on set, they're not in the water, they're just like, do-do-do-do, rowing in a boat, not touching any water, just rowing in a boat, just acting. Oh, the, it's, it's Canon Films showing their... Showing their budgetary restrictions yeah. again. Yes. It was just like watching it. It's like all of a sudden, boom. What the fuck is... And there's a point where Alan Quartermain, uh sees a snake. It's a big rubber snake that pops out. <laughs> it's like, stab it. <laughs> Fucking rubber snake. It's so horrible. Okay, so... All right, all right. So, Sharon Stone is in this movie, too. Uh... As in the first movie, of course. She's the love interest of Quartermain. I caught her name, too, and I forgot what her name is already. God damn it. I think her name's... Jessie. Jessie. Thank you. I was just going to say Jessie before you said it. Um, she's not that annoying this time, actually. She's icy coherent this time. Um, oh. She probably got wrapped on by... Uh, uh, by uh, Globus and the other guy. Yeah, um, so she, at first, at the beginning, they, uh, they plan on going to America to get married because she didn't want to get married in Africa. So they, uh, she gets so excited because she gets a package, and it's, it's Quartermain's suit. It's like this plaid suit she wants him to wear, wants him to wear for the wedding, and he starts wearing it. It's just like, ah, oh, this is so tight, this is unnatural, I don't like this. Because he's used to wearing the jungle garb all the time. <sighs> so weird. Um, the, the plot is very interesting. I don't know how they d- wrote this, but the plot revolves around African tribes. And Quartermain has a brother. Uh, he's gone. Where's my brother? I gotta find my brother. So his brother is in a lost city of gold. That I don't ah, think. <laughs> like the title. Like the title. Uh, they don't. I don't remember they said a name for it, but they there's like this one guy was like trying to run away from these tribes because it's like it's like <laughs> the brother is in the lost city of gold, and he had he had a gold piece with him. And there's a scene where 
the, he's trying to figure out where this gold piece coin came from, and she's he tells uh, Jesse, you know, here, can you look at it? Because you're the resident archaeologist here. I was like, did you study? And she started putting glasses on. It's like, hmm, this is from blah, 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 blah. This, is, this language is blah, 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 blah. She starts speaking this mumbo jumbo, like, ancient, you know, dialect thing. And I was just like, when did they develop her character so quickly as being so smart? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was just like, I'm, she's, she's like, hmm, let me look at you. Ah, it's, <laughs> it just comes out of nowhere. I'm going to be helpful this time and not just a piece of ass. Yeah, she was, she, she, all right, but so, Cornerman gets wrapped into this whole brother thing, you know, because, of course, Jesse was like, I want to go to America and get married with you, and this, you know, this time would be our honeymoon by now, and it's just like, and then Cornerman gets all wrapped up in this, and she's like, you know what, fine, I'm leaving, and she starts driving off, you know, going to the airport to go to America, she's in the car driving, all pissed off, and she's on, she's on the edge of the cliff where, and this guy in the car is like, oh, don't, 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 don't go too far off the edge, you're gonna f crush the car, and she's like, you know what, screw him, I'm gonna go to America, I don't need him, he doesn't need me, I just wanna get married, I'm just a super girl, and then all of a sudden, you know what, I'm going to go back. He needs me. He can't live without me. And he starts, she turns around the car. She just, like, takes her, like, normal garb and just takes it off. You know, she kind of goes half naked and she's, like, puts her jungle garb on. It's like, all right, I'm on for adventure. I'm coming, honey. Why not? But the whole movie, I was just watching it. It gets boring because all they do is travel, travel, travel. But, uh... James Earl Jones is in, this, in this movie. He plays like the black sidekick, basically. He's along for the, the adventure with them. You know, he's got this big axe. You know, it's like I'm, I've got this deep voice and I've got this axe. I am a war. You don't mess with me. I will go help you, Quartermain. <laughs> just, just okay. I was Darth Vader. <laughs> okay. Okay, he just goes, goes on for... There's this other character. He's like this religious-type character. He's like... Uh, the best way I'm trying to compare to him is... Um, that one... Uh, is he like Arab or something? It's like He has like a, a tunic or something on. And he's from DuckTales, the movie. Who was stealing all the spoons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's kind of like that character. Uh, Rip Taylor? No, no, no. That, uh, was, that, that, that guy? Was, no, not Rip Taylor. It was the, um, the, the the henchman of Christopher Lloyd's villain that was just, you know... Oh, that guy. Because I was thinking, I was like... Because <laughs> there's a point where all the something metal pops out of his uh, clothing. It's like, oh, that, that, that was not me. That, he set me up. He he put those things in my suit. He, that, I did not steal these. Oh, please, God, don't do that to me. <laughs> so it's the same... It's the same actor? No. It's not. Or it's the same type of character. Same type of character. Same type of character. And it's not even. This came out in like '87, and DuckTales movie came out in the '90s. I'm just thinking like the DuckTales movie, the worst movie. Look at the character. It's like nobody who saw this. Disney's like nobody saw this movie anyway, so let's just rip off this character. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds like what you're describing is just a typical lackey. Yeah, yeah, freaking, he doesn't do nothing, he's just, like, in the in the canoe, or in the boat, or walking along, he's like, oh, please, God, do, 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 do. and he's just like, oh, da, 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 because the tribe are throwing stuff, and I was like, oh, don't, don't, do, don't do it to me, it's fucking plus, throughout the whole thing, he's like, oh, I know your brother, I know what it is, I'll be there for the ride, I'll be the guide, I'll show you the way, but I don't want to do anything, Mm. But they, they travel, they just, they're going through Africa, you know, they see the tribes, and the tribes are just, like, throwing spears at them, and they go through water, you know, but, okay, so they're traveling, they're on canoe, on boat, like I said, they go through this, like, this water slide of a river thing, and like I said, it was green screened, and it, mm. and it, I don't know if they were going, like, underground or something, because they were, like, 
It's like, it's getting really hot down here. Oh, this, hot, this water is hot. And it's like, are we going by a volcano? And it's just like... And Cornman's like, this is the devil's heart. I'm thinking, what part of Africa has, like, that kind of water? And it's just... And there's a point where they're traveling through the, the devil's heart. And all of a sudden, this big flame comes out of the water. And it's, like, burning red hot, you know, it's fire... They're trying to avoid the fire, trying to avoid it, trying to avoid it, trying to avoid it. And Quartermain's like, I got my gun. I'll just shoot a slug, slug tight up in the sky or slug might, whatever the hell it is, in the cave. And let, it, let the splash move us away from the flame. He goes, bang, 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 bang. Uh, nothing happened. And it's like, oh my, I think this, this is just our demise now. This is, we're, honey, I think this is going to be in for us. And she's like, oh, Oh no! And he starts passing out, and all of a sudden, this big chunk from the ceiling just whoosh, poof, splashes everything, and they're avoided the flame. And it's just this is so stupid. Mm. It's so stupid. And then they keep going. They end up is going. Is there a point for any of it? There's no. It's like there's just not enough action for it. It's like they're traveling. They're just traveling. There's no I'm sure there's action where they're fighting tribe. They're fighting the tribe men, you know, they're punching and shooting and punching and shooting, punching and shooting. And James Earl Jones was like having his axe is like choo 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 blocking all the spears. Choo 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 choo. It's like this is not exciting, people. Not exciting at all. And they get up to it's, it's no character development, it sounds like. No. They end up going to the lost city of gold, as they say. His brother's just fine. And it's a colony of the purest white people. Like, they're all dressed in white clothes or white. It's like a community of people. I don't know. I couldn't understand that. I was just like, okay, this is a, a society where they wear white clothes and they're living life to the fullest, I guess. And There's these other... Do they have... Do they have... Are they, like, albino? No. I could be wrong. I'm not saying they're white people. They're just like people dressed in white clothes. Like it's just the purest, you know, like a cult, not like a cult, but just like a community where they just wear in white clothes. I don't understand. I don't know what it is. Like maybe I had to have to watch it again to understand that part. I just like fuck it. Who cares? It's almost done with the movie. There's two other. I guess the the whole uh, city is run by this leader who sacrifices people They're like you walk into the temple and there's like this switch underneath the table and there's like this door so this round the trap door opens up and it's like basically cardboard you see this thing go into the volcano it's like somebody falls in and it's just something happens something happens Something happens to fight the tribe. Okay, at the end, there's a huge climax, and, the, and I think the African tribes, African tribes, find them in this in this lost city, and it turns out to be like the climax of Army of Darkness. <laughs> I swear, it's dark. You see all these this big massive army come in to try to get inside, and you see the people inside are like, "Come on, let's go, rally up the troops, get all the arsenal, give me everything you got." It's like, did I put in the wrong movie all of a sudden? Like, when did this become Army of Darkness? Like, it just felt the same. Would, uh, would Joe Satriani's Speed of Light uh, improved anything? <laughs> it probably would. It probably would. <laughs> um, but then they end up thwarting the, the leader, and it's like, no more sacrifices, no more sacrifices, Yay! And the city, the city is all happy now because the tyrant's over, and and she's, and then it's like happy ending. It's like, oh, are you ready for one more grand adventure? Let's get married in America. <laughs> until uh, until several years later, when uh, the actor playing Alan Quartermain comes out and says he's gay. <laughs> but. Uh, from what you're describing here, it sounds like it sounds like what they said. And, I, and I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring up 
a case here of, um, uh, again, some trivia. Uh, after after Raiders of the Lost Ark, this this was one actually of many movies that was uh, uh, that was uh, trying to capitalize on that 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 tone of adventure. Uh, other titles I'm looking at, obviously there's King Solomon's Mines, which came before this, but um, uh, other films I see here, uh, Sky Pirates, River of Death, High Road to China, I haven't, I haven't ever even heard of those movies, but yeah, the only reason why I'm familiar with the uh, Alan Quartermain films is obviously we did did our canon research, but before that, you know, there are other things that I heard about them. Um, the one thing it sounds like they're they're forgetting about is is to take a breath and actually develop characters. Um, you you can't just uh, take a character like um, like Jesse Turner that. Uh, Turn her from this uh, uh, this neurotic bimbo uh, who screams all the time in the first film to uh, suddenly put some glasses on her or something or, or whatever it is that they do and and she's got she's got her chops. Well, Maybe I... there was something in between movies that that happened that we just didn't know about. Take that back. There's actually a bit where she does scream and run frantically for one bit. Like so, she she's technically still the same character where she does scream and run around him. But they but it takes a back seat more, and they focus on her being this. They've been like I think because I think they've said that they've been together for like at least six months now in the movie. So. There's that gap between the first movie and the second movie, and maybe something's rubbing off from Jesse to from at Quartermain. So maybe Quartermain's like rubbing off on her, you know? Maybe. So, wasn't too sure. Suddenly she just became. Uh, suddenly she just uh, became smart. Yeah. So. And uh, figured figured, hey, I know something about the city of lost gold that Ellen Quartermain does not, because hey, script said so. Yeah, it just seemed like it was so boring and nothing was funny. There was nothing. There was no good parts in it. I mean, they had just, they just wasted James Earl Jones in the damn movie. Like he barely did anything. Like sure, he had his big massive battle axe. You know, he was blocking shit and he cut a table in half. Ooh, he cut a table in fucking half. Big whoopee fucking do. Your battle axe ain't Hello. doing shit. Oh well. Don DeLuise launching a guy through a window with a table was much more <laughs> effective, apparently. Uh, yeah. It's just, maybe I... I mean, for adventure films, they're supposed to... You gotta have some action. It's an action-adventure, obviously. It's a, it's a subgenre of action, in a way. You gotta have some action, at least, within your adventure, going traveling on a journey... You know, they didn't do much. Like, all they did was travel, meet some African tribes. Oh, they think they're the devil. Oh, devil, devil, devil. Let's fight, 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 and punch, 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 and bang, bang, bang. And it's just like there's nothing substance in there. There's nothing that coherently works as an adventure. Like, so what if your brother's lost, Quartermain? Oh, it's just family and my best friend, too. That's what he's trying to convince Jesse to be like, Let's not get married now. Let's just find my brother. And it's just like, I didn't know you had a brother, Cornermain. When did you have a brother? When did you have a fucking brother? It's like, who cares about that? It's like, he's fine. You know, you, he, you end up seeing him at the end of the film. He's fine. He's not in danger or nothing. So the pointless of the journey was just so stupid. It's like, oh, if his brother was in peril, fine. Go on the adventure. But if he was just fine all along, you know, it's not even fucking worth it. He's better off where he where he was the whole time, not just... Well, if he didn't know that, if he didn't know what, he, what was going on... That's true. That's true, actually, if he didn't know that. But it's just like... It just... 
<laughs> if I was doing that, it's like, oh, wait a minute, you've been fine the whole time, I wasted so many time and hours just to see you, and it's just... That sounds like a setup for a, for a, for turning the, the series into a screwball comedy. Like, the, the <laughs> climax is just, oh, I was okay the whole time. <laughs> I'm with the whitest people in Africa. We're all good. I don't know, I just... Like, King Solomon's mind was, like, way better. <laughs> like, like you could understand the story. You could understand... the. There's hilarious bits in there, like... <laughs> I got it. I got it! It's just... It's so memorable compared to this piece of shit. At least... Yeah, it it had that in there. It, it sounds like what what you saw was... Oh my god, what an unfortunate name. James Earl Jones' character was... Um... Um Slopagas? Yes. Yeesh. That almost sounds like the character he played in, uh... Oh, what was it? In Exorcist 2. Like, if they decided to make make that, like, entire <laughs> Lotus guy <laughs> into a full-on character. Yeah, it's... Go like this. Uh, it's just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, slopagas, um, slopagas, um, slopagas, um, slopagas, yeah, yeah, it is it weird, it sounds like he's supposed to be, it sounds like he's supposed to be doing something like an action, oh, um, 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 uh, <laughs> it just, with an event, see, like another example of an Avenger film that I've watched somewhat recently was Tomb Raider, um, Laura, Laura Croft Tomb Raider, which is in sense was a Avenger film in vain of like Indiana Jones or Alec Quartermain, for example. With her, she, ex- she displayed the traits of the adventurer. She was on these quests or journeys to exotic locations, looking for treasure, finding this, this, and that. Not looking for a long-lost brother or anything like that. (laughs) And just, overall, just, it's, like, there's other movies in comparison you can actually say it's better than this Lost City of Gold movie. Just, like, just go watch King Solomon Mines. Just, it's way better. You'll get a gas. Go watch Indiana Jones. Go watch Indiana Jones. Yeah. Just skip Simple over solution. the rest of that. Simple solution. Just go watch Indiana Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm looking at this one called High Road to China. It has Tom Selleck. Okay. Tom, yes, Tom Selleck has been in quite a few uh, adventure films. Um, hmm. I think there's one called Quigley and Down Under, actually, oddly enough. It's in Australia, too. Oh, what a quinky dink. What a quinky dink might. Um, adventure films are definitely a, a genre of films that don't get a lot of, like, there's so many space adventures, it's unbelievable. There's, like, I've seen, like, let's talk about Star Trek Beyond, that's a space adventure. It's just, like, it's... I wish there was a more... Like, there's fantasy adventures. Oh, there's Lord of the Rings and frickin' The Hobbit. It's like, all oh, the Pirates of Caribbean movies. That's a pirate movie. I wish we had just more adventure films where we go on a journey looking for lost treasure like Indiana Jones. You know? Well, we are gonna get it for Indiana Jones, technically. Oh, well, I know that, but... I want more. More besides Indiana Jones, because he's, he's such a frickin' franchise right now, as it is, and... I don't know how they're gonna recover after Crystal Skull. That was oh, not a bad movie. I enjoyed it. Away. How would you survive a nuke in a fucking fridge? I don't care. <laughs> aliens. Simple. Aliens. Aliens. I don't care. <laughs> My God, there are aliens. <laughs> the fridge. It's so implausible. You never seen that episode of uh, South Park? That's a classic episode. Oh, I fucking love that episode. 
Oh, but next time we're going to revisit a topic that we've discussed a few years ago. We're going to discuss musicals again. Musicals revisited. So, if we have our chance to do musicals part two, as we said in the original episode, we could, there's tons to go through, and we could talk about Broadway, we could talk about musical musicals, jukebox musicals, anything's up for grabs now. Um, we could talk about Annie, Jersey Boys, you know, anything. <laughs> anything. And mm-hmm. there, there could be a special appearance by my girlfriend who she loves musicals and she'll be talking about Les Miserables. Yeah, she mm-hmm. will talk about Les Miserables. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's that's always my my that's honestly always my favorite part in uh, what was the review in the King and I one. It is amazing. <laughs> and I'm gonna be stuck in between trying to decide. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band or Bugsy Malone? I think I know which one I'm going to do, actually. Like, you know what? I'm going to go all out for it. You want me to save it for now, or do you want me to say it? You want to? That's nah, rude. I'll, sa- I'll save it for later. Okay. I'm not going to say it here in public. I'm yeah. Just wait. Yeah. So you'll be surprised when you see it. And I'm going to talk about... The Who, like baby. Tommy Pickles? <laughs> the Who, baby. He sure plays a main pinball. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's Tommy. That's Tommy. Tommy! <laughs> Tommy! Yes. Tommy! I, <laughs> Tommy! Tommy, my pinball! <laughs> uh, I believe Devin's going to be on the episode. She's going to talk about hairspray, so... Yay! Hey, it's going to be Cinema Royale, the girlfriend edition. Uh, girls love... Oh, I'm out. Musicals. <laughs> other than that, thanks for listening to this episode. What other adventure films do you like? Please leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe for more Cinema Royale. Please give that like button and share it if you like it. Thank you and good night. Ciao for now. See you later, dudes. And remember, Wacky Jesus loves you. And now we sleep. <laughs> Wacky Jesus says good night, everybody. He will go sleep and hey. Says Wacky Jesus, hey, for horses.